If you read the paper every day, and you should, there are some words that seem to pop up a lot in the Middle East, specifically around Israel. Words like Intifada, like Hamas, like Hezbollah, Gaza Strip, Golan Heights, West Bank, Occupied Territories. And you might ask yourself, why is it that those words pop up so frequently? And more generally, why is it that the people of the Middle East, Jews and Muslims, hate each other so much? What are the roots of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Well, stay tuned as we explore the history of Israel since independence in 1948, all the way to the present and maybe even the future. In the previous video, I retraced the history of Israel going all the way back to the ancient times. I'm not going to go over the same material again, uh, but the main gist of the argument was this, that Jerusalem and Israel in general uh, would be a city that is crucial to the three big religions of the region, uh, where there is Judaism, because to the Jews this land is the promised land that was promised to them uh, by Yahweh, and that they controlled briefly during the kingdom of David and Solomon about 3,000 years ago. To the Muslim is also a important area because this is where Muhammad ascended into the heavens and this is an area of the world that they also controlled uh, during the time of the Arab Empire and the Ottoman Empire for most of the Muslim uh, Middle Ages and then into the early modern era. Uh, for Christians that's also a very uh, crucial area uh, because this is a place where Jesus spent the last week of his life and died. And that's an area that the Christians also controlled uh, during the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, briefly during the Crusades, and again briefly in the 20th century uh, when there was a British mandate in Palestine. So that leads us all the way to where we stopped in 1948, which is a time where, right after World War II, uh, there was a desire on the part of the uh, international community uh, to dismantle the British colonial empire, including the mandate in Palestine, and then create a, a place for the people that had survived the Holocaust uh, to have a state of their own, thus fulfilling the old dream of Theodor Herzl, what was called the Zionist dream of having a homeland for Jewish people. And at the same time, you had a significant Muslim population, often of Arab blood, uh, and Arabs would be an ethnic group of the Middle East, most of them Muslim, but uh, some of them Christian. You have some Arab Christians in Israel. And well, it was their land too, so they wanted to have a, a country of their own as well. Uh, the British decided to do the same thing that they had done just a year before, 1947, uh, in India, where they were also decolonizing that colony, and because there was a large Muslim population and a large Hindu population, they ended up creating two states. Uh, one that would be a Hindu-majority India, and then a Muslim-majority Pakistan, which back then incorporated Bangladesh as well. Uh, we have a video about that. So in 1948, the British and the UN kind of followed the same recipe and created two states. One uh, called Israel, that would be for the Jewish people, and you can see on that map the way the borders were supposed to be set up, so it's kind of complicated. And then another uh, state right nearby, kind of intertwined with it, that would be Palestine, and this one would be more for the Arabs. And Jerusalem, because it was a city so important to the three main religions of the era, uh, would be governed as an international city uh, that would not be attributed to one particular religion. At least that's a plan drafted by the UN as of 1948. However, as soon as the uh, independence was proclaimed in 1948, a war broke out between the Jewish and Muslim people of the area. Uh, the Muslims, would be uh, the vast majority of the people in the area, figured if we all band together against the Jewish people, we could easily uh, brush them aside, push them into the sea. And at that point, Israel is just a very new state uh, with a small population, many of them survivors from the Holocaust who had just shown up in, in Israel. So it's easy to think uh, that they could be easily be defeated. As it turned out, however, uh, the Jewish state uh, fought back bravely and miraculously survived, and in fact expanded its borders a bit more. Uh, so much so that when the dust settled uh, after that war in 1948, the Palestinian people that were supposed to have a state of their own did not. Parts of their land would be incorporated into a bigger Jewish state than, than was anticipated. And then some other lands, like the Gaza Strip, would be incorporated into Egypt, and others, like the West Bank of the Jordan River, uh, would be incorporated into the state of Jordan nearby. And so the Palestinians uh, ended up being a people without a, a state. Uh, and if you ask yourself, why is it that you have terrorism or uh, unrest in Israel today? That, in a short way, is the answer. Uh, the Palestinians are a people without a state and have been since 1948. Uh, this conflict, 1948, is referred to by the Palestinians as the catastrophe. 
So in the years that followed, there was a lot of attempts by neighboring uh, Muslim states uh, to win the next war and, and to try to dislodge the Jewish state militarily. Uh, those wars came just about every 10 years uh, on average. So the next big one was in the 50s, in 1956. Uh, it's a conflict known as the Suez Crisis. And we have a whole video on uh, Nasser during that period in, in Egypt. So I'll just give you the, the Cliff Notes version of that. Uh, but basically, in 1956, the neighbor, uh, Nasser in Egypt, uh, made a lot of threatening noises uh, against Israel. He also happened to nationalize the Suez Canal, which used to be owned by France and Britain. And so Israel, France, and Britain jointly decided to attack Egypt and successfully did so. They defeated the state of Egypt. Uh, as it happened, diplomatically, Nasser managed to hold on to the Suez Canal anyway. Uh, but as far as just the military battle, uh, the Jewish state allied with the French and the British uh, was successful. So that's the second conflict, another Jewish victory. The next conflict uh, came another 10 years later or so in 1967. This one is known as a Six-Day War because it lasted all of six days. And this one is the most one-sided victory that Israel ever had against its neighbors. Uh, Israel attacked at the same time Syria to the northeast, Jordan to the east, and again Egypt to the southwest. And in a matter of just six days, defeated all three of them uh, this was especially striking when it came to fighting Egypt, a country with a much larger population, uh, still ruled by Nasser, uh, who had again made big noises about attacking and destroying Israel and spent a lot of money buying big airplanes from Russia and so forth. And it was just crushed in six days. Uh, that air force of Egypt uh, never even took off from the airport. So as a result, after six days, your know, neighbors kind of a suit for peace. Israel expanded even further than it had since 48 and 56. And that's where you get the occupied territories, places like the Gaza Strip uh, that used to be an Egyptian territory, uh, was occupied by the uh, Jewish state, uh, the whole of Jerusalem and the West Bank of the Jordan River, and then all the way in the north, the Golan Heights taken from Syria. And they look very, very small on the map, uh, but they are strategically important because they control the headwaters of the Jordan River, one of the few sources of water in the region. And initially, there was uh, also control of the Sinai Desert, uh, taken also from Egypt, so all the way to the Suez Canal. So that's really a one-sided uh, Israeli tri triumph, but also one that creates some problems in the long run, because now that meant there was a large Arab or Muslim population living in the occupied territories under Israeli rule. Fast forward to the next decade, the 1970s, and you have the last of those major wars. It's called the Yom Kippur War, because it started when the Muslim state in the area attacked uh, Israel during that holy uh, holiday of uh, Yom Kippur. And as a result, uh, kind of caught the Israeli army by surprise. And this is a conflict that the Israel managed to win at the very end, but it was a much closer call. Uh, it's not a, a kind of a one-sided triumph like 1967 had been. Ever since then, you have had some conflicts in the area. Uh, there was a fairly important conflict in 82 in uh, Lebanon, but by and large, no repeat of those big uh, conflicts that you've had uh, between Israel and its neighbors. Uh, the reason being that it's become clear after four defeats in secession that Israel's Muslim neighbors can't defeat it. If they couldn't do it in 48 when it was a new state uh, with a few survivors from the Holocaust, and surely they can't do it after the 1970s when Israel becomes a much more powerful state. With the full support of the United States, access to modern weaponry that the U.S. gives every year in large quantities, and now actually Israel has developed the atomic bombs. So it's clearly a state that couldn't, can no longer be defeated uh, by the neighbors. So that's the situation ever since. A, a powerful Jewish state surrounded by hostile neighbors and with a large population of Muslim Palestinians living under Jewish occupation and, and people without a state. So if you are a Palestinian living in the occupied territories in the 1970s, what are you going to do? Obviously, you can't defeat Israel by conventional means. So you shift to other tactics that might be the weapons of the weak against the strong. And in the class, we've studied a number of those. We've talked about the guerrilla warfare employed by, say, Fidel Castro in Cuba, Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam, or even the methods like terrorism that Ben Bella and the FLN had employed against the French in Algeria. So that's what uh, the Palestinians did. Uh, the main Palestinian group in the 1970s was called the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO. It was led by Yasser Arafat. In the 1970s, the PLO was particularly well known for using terrorism and specifically hijacking. Security on when boarding airplanes was not quite as tight as it is today, so it was quite common. You have dozens of cases in the 70s of uh, hijackings. Usually uh, ended up with more negotiation. It was not like crashing your airplane into the Twin Towers on 9-11s, 
uh, more the kind of stuff where you would land at a place like, say, Entebbe Airport in Uganda and then start negotiating. So in that particular hijackings, uh, the, the Mossad, the Israeli uh, secret forces, were able to uh, recover the airplane and uh, the passengers. Another famous uh, case of uh, terrorist activity in, uh, was in 1972 in Munich. That year, the Olympics were held in Bavaria, in Germany. And because the Olympics are so well covered by the international press, uh, that would be a great way to get publicity if you want the, the PLO. So the idea there was to infiltrate the Olympic village, capture a number of Israeli athletes, take them hostage. Very, very famous case, which uh, ended tragically eventually as the hostage takers were leaving from the compound uh, where the hostages, uh, there was a botched raid by the German police that ended up very badly, and so most of the hostage takers and a lot of the hostages as well uh, were killed in the process. If you're interested in learning more about that story, I would highly recommend watching a movie by Steven Spielberg that is called Munich, uh, which covers that hostage situation, but also the attempts by the Mossad in the years that followed to identify all the persons responsible for it in the PLO and then assassinate them. While we're at it, uh, just go and watch a second Spielberg movie. This one uh, would be about the, the Holocaust and World War II. It's a beautiful but also quite moving movie, uh, Schindler's List. So this tactic of terrorism continued throughout the 1980s, uh, including what was known as the Intifada, where uh, Palestinian youths would start throwing rocks at Israeli tanks. Uh, it's kind of a battle of David against Goliath, except in that case, the Jewish state would be a, a Goliath. And that continued up until the 1990s, in a way, all the way uh, to the present. So shifting back uh, to Israel and the world community in general, how can you resolve that conflict? How can you make sure that there's no longer a conflict between the dominant Jewish state and the stateless Palestinians? And that's a question that a lot of American presidents have asked themselves. You might ask yourself, why is it that the United States was interested in that Israeli-Palestinian conflict? After all, it's not directly an American business. Well, part of it was that uh, the United States was a superpower after 1945 and tending to meddle in the affairs of everyone worldwide. Uh, there's also the fact that the Middle East is uh, a place where there's a lot of oil, not so much in Israel per se. Uh, most of it is around the, the Persian Gulf. In fact, uh, some Jewish people like to joke that Moses wandered around the desert for 40 years and somehow stopped in the one country in the Middle East that does not have oil. But even though Israel does not have much oil of its own, uh, because the region is so rich in oil, there's a fear that any kind of conflict between Israel and its neighbors uh, would result in tensions throughout the region and then a spike in the price of oil. Uh, specifically in 73, when you have that Yom Kippur war, the price of oil on the world markets doubled. And then in 79, when you have another crisis in Iran with the overthrow of the Shah, and we'll have another video about that, uh, the price of oil doubled again. And that led to an economic crisis throughout uh, Europe and North America, uh, what was known as stagflation. So you want Israel to have good relations with its neighbors, if anything, because it will keep the price of oil low. Uh, beyond that, uh, there's a large Jewish population in the US, so American politicians want to cater to the needs of their constituents. Uh, the Jewish population in the US tends to vote more heavily democratic. Another important voting group uh, would be the evangelicals, and these tend to vote more Republican. Uh, they're Christian, but they have a strong attachment uh, to uh, the state of Israel, mostly for theological reasons that this is where the second coming of Christ is supposed to happen and the rapture and all of that business. So basically you need to have a state of Israel so that Jesus can come back. Uh, so whether you're Republican or Democratic, there's a strong interest uh, in what happens in Israel. So as a US president, if you step in the conflict as an honest broker, uh, how can you affect peace? And the main solution that has been offered time and again is what is called land for peace, meaning that the state of Israel would have to give away some of the land uh, that they control presently to the Palestinian side, because this way that would make the Palestinians happy. Uh, that's what they want, a state of their own. In exchange for which, the Palestinian side, or Muslims in general, would have to uh, give away uh, all their claims against Israel and specifically stop attacking it, harassing it, or talk about the destruction of the state of Israel. And that can work. Uh, in uh, 1978, as I recall, there was an important agreement uh, done at Camp David in the US, uh, where Jimmy Carter, the US president, he got the two sides from Israel and Egypt, Begin and Sadat, uh, to get together and sign uh, Camp, Davis, uh, uh, Camp David agreements, uh, whereby Israel gave away the Sinai Desert back to Egypt, that, the land aspect, in exchange for which Egypt recognized the state of Israel, agreed that it had the right to exist, and promised not to attack it in the future. That's the peace agreement. 
So the idea would be, in the long run, to replicate that, uh, that agreement, uh, not just between Israel and Egypt, but between Israel and Jordan, or Syria, uh, or uh, the Palestinians in the occupied territories. There have been a lot of efforts over the years, specifically in the late 1990s. Bill Clinton came very close to an agreement of that sort, uh, except, unfortunately, it collapsed. So that's kind of where we are uh, today. Complicating the matter, uh, quite importantly, is the fact that you have, well, idiots on both sides, uh, hardliners, let's call them. On the Muslim side, you have people that still don't want to acknowledge that the state of Israel, the Jewish people, can exist. And you have Holocaust deniers, people who speak about destroying the state of Israel, pushing the Jewish people into the sea, uh, with a kind of agenda that is obviously not conducive to a long-term peace. On the Jewish side, you also have some hardliners who think that, well, they should control the entirety of the Promised Land because their God gave it to them. And to make sure that there's never any kind of lasting land for peace agreement where you could give away the West Bank and create a state there, they have decided to move into those areas, uh, into predominantly Muslim or Christian areas, and have Jewish settlements, what are called the Jewish settlements. And so you have a large Jewish presence uh, in the West Bank as well nowadays, uh, which makes it kind of complicated to draw a line nowadays uh, because the, the Jewish presence is everywhere. To protect themselves from uh, terrorist incursions into Israel proper and also to protect some of the settlements, uh, the Jewish state in the past 10, 20 years has built a wall, which has a very complicated shape because it goes deep into the state of uh, what should be the state of Palestine into the West Bank uh, to protect some of the settlements or uh, generally claim more territory than should be uh, given to the state of Israel in the first place. So the fact that the wall is there and now it's kind of uh, deep inside the West Bank, that would make it very difficult for any kind of negotiator to draw a line uh, to say, well, Jewish people on that side, Muslim people on that side, and then we could have a two-state solution. Part of it is connected to the state of politics in Israel. The way the constitution works, you have proportional voting, which means in practice that you have a lot of different parties. Uh, if they get, I think, one person of the vote or more, they have deputies in parliament. So uh, you never have a party that controls all the elections, instead you have coalitions. And so if you are a right-wing party, like say that of Bibi Netanyahu, uh, you have to ally yourself with other groups that are farther to the right, far more religious groups, uh, just so that you have a majority in parliament. Well, that's it for today. I have now provided you with all the information that you need when one day you become uh, a member of the State Department or even US President yourself, and you want to tackle that problem of peace in the Middle East. I provided you with a briefing, it will be for you to write the future of history. Well, that's it for today. And the next few videos, we'll move more to the Muslim areas of the Middle East. Specifically, we'll have one video about the uh, state of Egypt under Gamal Abdul Nasser, and another one on Iran uh, from the time of the Shah of Iran to the time of the Ayatollahs. Stay tuned.